Hi guys, it's Mark Holthy, Canadian immigration lawyer, ex-immigration officer, and former high school teacher going live once again for another edition of our EE Live Q&A, which is our express entry live question and answer series right here on the Canadian Immigration Institute Facebook page. Previously broadcast in our Express Entry Law private Facebook group. And I've shifted now, for those of you who have not watched for a few months, I've shifted over to the Canadian Immigration Institute page because it makes it easier for all of you guys to actually share this when I go live, which is right now. So as I start to see you guys jumping on, if you think there's anyone out there that would like or benefit from what I'm gonna be talking about today in Express Entry, share it. Tag them, let them know that this is live, and then it can get the message out. Because as we know, Facebook sucks. And pretty much they determine what they think you guys should see. And even when you think you want to see this, they may think you don't want to see it. So um, they throttle what I'm posting. <laughs> so if you guys find that this is something that some of your friends may be interested, interested in, please uh, just tag them in one of the comments. And if others of you have suggestions on how to get this message out more broadly, um, because there would be nothing um, nothing more satisfying to me than to know that I'm getting the maximum exposure to this information that's all free. Answers to your questions that you would normally pay uh, to get guidance for, I am giving it all away for free, which is crazy, right? <laughs> what lawyer does that? Well, apparently I've been doing it for almost two and a half years now. All right, people are starting to pile in, which is great. Um, just a few little ho housekeeping matters as we wait for more people to come in. I'm looking for two things from you guys. The first thing that I'm looking for, and as I go here to our very own page, I'm gonna shift my screen around here. You will see right here, this awesome background image that was provided by Marlon uh, Pareo, who it, he's provided this to me of downtown Vancouver, BC. That is the backdrop image for the Canadian Immigration Institute's page, at least for now. So if you have a very cool picture that you want to share that I could use uh, as the background image for any of the social media channels that I have. So if I punch in YouTube here, let's see if I've got the right one connected. Yeah, I do. So if we go to my YouTube channel here uh, and some of you are watching, you'll see this amazing picture right here. Um, taken of Garibaldi Lake near Squamish, BC. And this was courtesy of uh, uh, Nisarji Shaw. And so I'd love for you guys to share your images that I can use as the background for, um, for the page. So that's the first thing that I wanted to share with you guys. The second thing is that I would love to have intro music. So um, those of you who, actually I'll share my screen again, I don't just do this, and many of you don't are, are not aware of my Canadian Immigration Podcast, but this right here is my Canadian Immigration Podcast. And if you listen to it, um, I actually have at the end of the podcast my little song. So there's a song that I had a couple down in the U.S. actually make for me, and I use that as my outro. But as I was going through this process and I was thinking about all the ways that I can improve these EE Live Q&As and all the videos that I'm doing, I, I discovered that some of you are talented. Some of you are musical. Some of you have been in bands. Some of you um, play in orchestras. Some of you have your own music. And I would love for you to share that with me and you can easily do it just by sending me a Facebook message. And then I'd love to feature or showcase your music in the intros or the outros to this video. Because, hey, I'm wasting time, probably about a minute or two minutes by the time everybody connects in before I can really get into the meat of what I'm trying to share. But what better way to showcase the awesome, amazing things that you guys all do, your talents, your abilities. And with that being said, I also want to let you guys know that I am in the process of looking for a new logo for my, my law firm. And so um, those of you who have skills as graphic designers, I tried to post a message um, through Facebook before, but if any of you are watching this and you have skills, I'd love to do a little horse trading with you. So basically, if you can develop a really cool logo for me, then I in turn will give you a free consult or assist you with your express entry. And 
you know, that's how the whole world functioned before cash became the reality. You know, some people who had skills and abilities and talents would share those with others who had other abilities and everybody would benefit together. So I just wanted to throw that one out there. Um, for those of you who are tuning in brand new, I want to let you know that there is um, uh, an ability here. If you are unable to watch this live right here, like the live listeners are, and those of you who are tuning in live, make sure you post in the comments where you're listening from. So I want to see where everybody's tuning in from. And so if you're unable to watch it live and there's Ralph Hansky, oh, Ralph, you're always there. You are so faithful, my friend. Um, you can, if you want to send in your question because you can't attend live, I do start off all of my EE live, excuse me, <laughs> all of my EE live Q and A's with, by answering the listener questions that come in via email. And Stephanie is the gatekeeper. And if you watched last week's video, she had a little cameo appearance, appearance here, but you have to get past her. So your question has to be general in nature. And the more it would actually benefit all of the listeners that are tuning in and watching these videos, then the more likely it's going to get through. If it's a specific question that really only relates to your unique circumstances, then that is legal advice. And that's something that you'd need to book a paid consultation. And I'll just have Stephanie post that link once again to the, um, the paid consultation uh, link on our um, law firm website. All right. So if you want to send in your question, send an email to Stephanie at stringham.ca and make sure you put EE Live Q&A in the subject line of your email. It needs to be exactly that. OK, so make sure 100 percent that it's EE Live Q&A. Then when Stephanie sorts through her email, she can target the ones that these fine people uh, indicated and then they can your question can be potentially chosen for one of these. All right. Looks like we've got a great group of people that have tuned in. I'm going to leave Stephanie's email there and the EE Live Q&A in the bottom just for those who are tuning in a little bit late. Um, you can see the feature question today. The feature question is about Canadian work experience. And some of you work for Canadian companies. And the question that comes back to me very, very frequently is if I'm working virtually for a Canadian company, full time, continuous work, at least 30 hours a week, you know, I, I, um, I'm paid, um, I'm paid on an hourly basis and all of this is documented. Can I claim that as Canadian work experience? And this actually came up from one of, uh, one of the consults that I had just the other day. And so here's the short answer. So where do you find answers? Well, you can go to the immigration, um, the IRCC website. So if I type in here, let's pull this up. If I go IRCC.ca, this, is not the right one. <laughs> if I go to, if I go to IRCC and just leave it as IRCC or immigration, it's actually, I keep forgetting that it's changed. It is actually Canada.ca forward slash EN, if you're English, forward slash immigration hyphen refugees hyphen citizenship. So long story short, here's a great place where a lot of the answers come from. But the real source of the information that is the law is actually not necessarily the government's interpretation of it in their policy that's contained within their website right here. In actuality, it comes from, in the case of express entry, the regulations or the ministerial instructions. So if I go MI, actually I'll type it in, ministerial instructions express entry let's see what comes up so ministerial instructions respecting the express entry system so this really is where the foundation is for information so the question becomes can i count work experience for a canadian company that has occurred while i've been living outside of canada and working virtually well the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to and i think it's section 15 I'm going to scroll down here until I get to section 15, I believe is the explanation for, yes. Okay, so section 15 is Canadian work experience. And I'm going to make this a little bit bigger for you fine, awesome people who are looking on your handhelds and are trying to see what I'm doing here. Looks like I went a little ways further here than I thought. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> That's what happens when you uh, increase the size of the font. Then you end up scrolling all the way past where you want it to be. So let's scroll back down here to 15. Okay, right here. I know that I could have searched it faster. But anyways, here's Canadian work experience. And, um, and so if we go through here and it talks about how the points are assigned. And if we scroll down here, so maximum points, what it means to have Canadian work experience. And this is, we've talked about this before, that you has to be skilled in one of zero A or B. It has to be full time, okay? It has to be one it, within the 10 years, immediately preceding the day on which the points are assigned to you. You have to be paid for Canadian work experience under the Canadian experience class. You actually don't um, have to be have worked continuously. That's the one difference between the Canadian experience class and the, um, the federal skilled worker program. But if we scroll down here, full time work in excess, work experience requirement, this is the key. So section 15 sub seven for the purpose of this section, which is all of section 15, this is where the answer comes, okay? The foreign national must have had temporary resident status during the period of work experience and any period of full-time study or training, whatever it might be. But the reality is they must have had temporary resident status. So that effectively kills any possibility of you being able to claim this virtual work experience for the purposes of the Canadian experience class. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off this, um, that I'm going to add a little, a little element to this that came from one of the questions that a listener sent in. So this is Akil. And Akil says, first of all, apart from my issue, I must appreciate your efforts and sincerity for clients you are putting in. I've been watching uh, your YouTube uh, for weeks and I'm amazed. That's great. Thank you so much, Akil. He says, well, I need information regarding my work experience in Canada while I was working from my home country. So this is exactly the situation that we're talking about. The employer is willing to give a reference letter and experience letter as well, stating all of the requirements mentioned in the EE requirement section. And for those who are tuning in, let's shift back here. And this is where we go back to the website and we're going to go to the completeness check. So the completeness check site on the IRCC website, and this is the heading for those of you who are tuning in new applications. If you Google that, you will find it. And if you go down here and we look for work experience, what Akil is talking about is he says his Canadian employer is willing to give him a letter that contains this information, okay? That contains his job title, duties and responsibilities, job stats, dates worked for the company, number of work hours per week, and the annual salary and benefits. So, so far so good, he says. They're willing to do that. Um, he said that, uh, but my salary was too low as per standards of Canada, and I do not have any T4s and evaluation of performance. So my questions are, can I add that work experience? How will I be able to prove it? I will really appreciate your support. So this is a great question. So he has here that it's the annual salary plus benefits, but he's concerned that it's too low. Now he didn't indicate what his actual position was. But if we go back to the actual ministerial instructions, okay, and you'll remember here, it says the foreign national must have a temporary resident status in order to claim Canadian work experience for the purposes of um, the Canadian experience class. But if you go through here and we go up to, um, you can see right here, for the purposes of this section, Canadian work experience is work experience that is acquired by a foreign national in Canada. Okay, so obviously right off the bat, we're limited. So this is where we can't claim Canadian work experience for the purposes of the Canadian experience class. But let's take a look at foreign work experience. So let's just, I'm going to see if I can find it. Foreign work experience. Okay, and then we're going to shift down here till we find the definition. Okay, here we go. Okay, so this is for the purposes of section 23 and 24. Foreign work experience is that is acquired by a foreign national outside Canada in one or more occupations, okay? 
So what's missing from this? If we want to count Canadian work experience, then it's work experience that's gained while you're in Canada. Foreign work experience is acquired by a foreign national outside Canada. So what does that mean? Does it mean that the position has to be outside Canada or that the individual is? Well, as far as I'm concerned, when I read this, it indicates it's acquired by a foreign national outside Canada. So I don't have any issues, Akhil, and I would, I would tackle this. I would go for it. I would say, yes, you can claim it, but you would claim it as foreign work experience and not Canadian work experience, and it would be used for the Federal Skilled Worker Program and not the Canadian experience class. So back to the wage issue. You're concerned that you're being paid less than the minimum wage or the prevailing wage for that position in Canada. Don't worry about that. So let's take a look at this, okay? So we've got that first thing outside Canada. It's skilled, it's full-time work or the equivalent in part-time. It's acquired within the last 10 year period preceding the day on which you're allocated the points and you're paid, okay? So it's remunerated by the payment of wages or commission. It doesn't say how much. So you should have no issues with this, all right? So you can see as you go through these instructions and as you go through the specific requirements here, the amount that you're paid does not factor into this equation. And for, for those of you who are working outside of Canada for a Canadian employer virtually, that work experience should be eligible under the Federal Skilled Worker Program. So as long as you can get a, a reference letter, just like it says here, that can list all of these things, if you don't have a Canadian T4, well, you're not because you're not paying taxes in Canada. Um, and that's really what it comes down to. So great question, Akhil. Thank you for leading off with a fantastic, um, really flagship question <laughs> uh, for the purposes of our little EE Live Q&A today. Okay, so now I'm going to go back here and I want to see where you guys are all listening from. I'm going to take a peek while we transition now and I'm going to answer more of these listener questions. If you have a specific question, hold off. Do not, right now, post those questions in the comment section. And don't post them multiple times either, please, for my sanity. But let's see where people are tuning in from. Okay, Thoda is here. Great, and Thoda's tagging someone. Awesome. Abhishek. Um, hi, Mark. Is it snowing already? Saw a storm forecast for the weekend. Abhishek. Oh, do you know what? I wonder if I can show you guys. Well, I'll just show you, I'll, I'll just show you the pile of snow. So look out my window here as I turn, turn, turn. There's my car. And there you can see what's to the right of my car right there, a big honking pile of snow. <laughs> so it's a little bit hard to see in the camera, but that is a big pile of snow that was cleared out of the office yesterday. And those of you who are watching through uh, the Express Entry Law private Facebook group, I actually posted uh, um, a video yesterday there talking about the actual snow that was falling down all around and the craziness. It was amazing. It should not be happening this early, but unfortunately it did. So we just live with it. We just roll with it. Okay, let's go back and see what else we have here uh, from those who are watching live. Uh, Ralph says, hi Mark, how are you? I'm doing great, Ralph. Uh, Samit says, hi. Uh, Ridwan says, hey, what happens in the additional review phase? Redwan, post the question again when I tell you, and then I'll answer that one. Sheik says, hi, Mr. Mark. Hello, Sheik. Amrit Paul says, hello, Mark. Monica is tagging Thoda and uh, awesome. Uh, Icarus says, hi, Mark. Hello. Radwan says, um, he's asking a question about the rural Northwest Territory pilots. Those are not covered in this EE Live Q&A, my friend. If you want to book a consult, we can explore those. Um, <laughs> Sam says, Hello, Mark. I've been waiting for you for a long time. Great, Sam. And Sam's tuning in from Qatar. Yes, you have. Hold your question off, Sam, and I'll make sure I answered your question today. Anna says, is it necessary to apply? Okay, so all of you that are posting your questions. Uh, Radwan is from Red Deer, right here in Alberta. Very cool. Uh, Josenda is Burundi. Elaine is South Africa. Great, guys. Anna is in the Philippines. Um, Mukta is India. This is great. This is awesome. Okay, and for those of you who are posting the questions, Anand is from India, um, and we've got just a bunch of questions that have all piled in, so hold all of those off and then post them when I give you the sign to do it, okay? Um, 
All right, then we've got a bunch of other questions there. Uh, Elaine, yes, South Africa, great. Okay, and of course, my dear friend Ralph is Edmonton. Okay, uh, oh, and we've got Yuri from Poland. Welcome, Yuri. It's great to have you joining us. And uh, Jay De Silva is listening from Sri Lanka. Very cool. And I know there's a ton of other ones there, and I'm sure I've missed you, but uh, forgive me if, I've, if I have. Okay, I'm going to continue on with some more of the listener questions. Um, the ones that were sent in by email, and then I'm going to shift gears, and then I'm going to answer all of your live questions regarding Express Entry right here, right now on the Canadian Immigration Institute Facebook page. Okay, this one is from Sem. Aha! Hey, what do you know? Let me just see here. Is this you? It is Sem. Okay, so Sem, you are in luck, my friend. You are getting your question answered. Okay, and you see, I told you I was going to answer it. So Sam not only is watching live, but he also sent in this one. And check this out at the top, Sam. I want to show you, my friend. Look at that right there. See that big yellow star? That was one I flagged immediately to make sure that I answered it today. So those of you who are loyal, dedicated listeners, you do get rewarded. Okay, let's see what Sam's question is. So he says, hello, dear Stephanie. I am a super fan and follower of Mr. Mark in YouTube. Okay, flattery to Stephanie actually will go a long way. So you, you say nice things about her <laughs> and, and nice things about me. You have at least a shot of getting through. But remember, it still has to be a question of general applicability so that it benefits the thousands of people that watch these videos. Okay, so Sam says, I'm from Ukraine, and fortunately, I have uh, received an ITA by the Canadian government in August. Therefore, I have only remaining six days. This was sent Friday, September the 27th, 28th, 29th, 30th, 1, 2. My goodness, you are just about at the expiry of your ITA. Okay, well, we better get this question answered. My concern is that I've been in the U.S. with a J-1 visa status, and I also worked um, as a work and travel student in 2008, okay? During my stay in the U.S., I visited Niagara Falls. And at that day, our tourist guide told that whoever wants to go to see Niagara Falls view from the other side are not required a visa by Canadian government, which is wrong, okay? Uh, so that guy, um, so that guys, you're free to go across the bridge. Oh, I'm sorry. I know that it sounds ridiculous, but we were young and we were cro and when we crossed the, the, the U.S. border and arrived to the Canada border, the officer nicely told us, okay, this is good. Back in 2008, maybe they were still a little bit nicer then. Um, as you are a J-1 visa student, you're not allowed to come over here. If you want, you need to get a visa. He gave us a proper a paper in order to make us eligible to turn back to the U.S. border. And we gave this paper to the U.S. border and they allowed us to re-enter back to the U.S. Okay, good. I'm glad that they allowed you back in. So now this is the question that Sam asked. And it's the question that relates to the statutory section. So he says there's a statutory question in the EAPR. I'll correct that in your email. You've got ITA here. But in the Electronic Application for Permanent Residence that states, have you ever been refused a visa or permit, denied entry or order to leave Canada or any other country? So should I say yes is it, to this question? Is it considered a refusal? If I say yes, what should I write in the explanation letter? Um, and then he, he's begging Stephanie for the answer. So this because, and you can see this one applies very particular to SEM, but this question and the answer that I'm going to give applies to everybody. When it comes to any kind of a denied entry or a refusal, to Canada or any other country, you always, always answer yes if it happened. In a situation like this, even though it was innocent and you were turned back, it was still a denied entry. And so you can explain exactly what you explained to me. You probably don't need to put as much detail in, um, but you're just going to say, back in 2008, I um, applied for entry to Canada but didn't realize I needed a visa. So my entry was denied and I returned back to the U.S. Simple as that. No issues whatsoever, and you will never, ever be harmed by disclosing those kinds of things. So those of you who, who are counseled by, you know, stupid advisors, you know, friends that are well-meaning, read something on the internet that says, don't disclose, it could hurt your application. Do not trust any of them, whether they're an immigration consultant, whether they're an overseas agent, 
whoever they are, do not trust them because you always, always disclose 100% honesty is the best policy. And understand that if you don't, and an officer can go back, they can see the records now. Canada can see all of the records for your history when you apply and they see that you were denied entry because if they gave you a form to go back, sometimes those allowed to leave forms are actually recorded in the GCMS notes. Back in 2008, it would have been FOSS, the field operators system for the border officers, but now they all use the global case management system, but it'll be a part of your record. And guess what happens if you don't disclose that? Guess. I won't even wait for you guys to answer. Well, no, I'm going to. Let's see who's tuning in. Let's see how long it takes for you guys to actually see this. So post in the comment section what you think would happen to Sam if he put no and did not disclose that, that, that refused entry. What could happen to him? Post right in there. Let's see. See if you know, Sam. What do you think? Any of you, any of you that are watching live, I want you to post in the comments and uh, let's see if you guys know what will happen to Sam if he put no here instead of yes. So my advice is yes. Exactly, Nelson. Thank you for answering. Misrepresentation. Priyanka says misrep. You bet. And the question I have for you is what is the consequence of misrep? What happens to someone who's found to have misrepresented on their applications? Post it in the comments. Oh, Sam is there. Banned five years, 100%. Okay, that's exactly what could happen. All right? Great, guys. Thank you. Okay, Sam, there's your answer. Hopefully, you have not yet filed your application. Visha, Sam is in trouble. Denied entry. Oh, Visha, that is, that is, uh, that is exactly what would happen. Yep, and Priyanka says denial. It's a five-year bar to coming to Canada. Now, I'm crossing my fingers, Sam, that you did not submit your application. <laughs> and if you, I, I'm telling everybody, when it comes to submitting your application, you absolutely need to have someone go through the process of reviewing to make sure that what you've got in there is correct. Now, express entry is not rocket science, but there are aspects of it that can have huge ramifications if you get it wrong. And sometimes the smallest little mistake, the tiniest little thing can result in your application at best getting returned for being incomplete or at worst, a finding of misrep and a bar for five years. And many of you guys are posting that. Wallace, Anand says Misra, Priyanka, uh, Priyanka says uh, denial, absolutely. Okay, so you guys know that. And, um, and so you never ever want to be in that position. But because of the volatility of express entry, you know if anything is wrong, we talked at, at length in past videos about even police certificates that have been uploaded in, in black and white instead of color can result in your application getting returned. Maybe you've uploaded the wrong document into the wrong spot and an officer can't find the one that you were supposed to include, then it gets returned. And so fine, what is the advice? What comes back when an application is returned? They say, oh, unfortunately, your application is incomplete. We're returning it. And uh, you can resubmit. Well, that's all fine. But what if the CRS score you have and the round of invitation that result in you, in you getting an ITA, what if it never drops down to that level again? And it is happening more and more and more to people as the, the comprehensive ranking system scores have just continued to climb. And so you can't, you can't take the chance, you can't trust it. So if you've got a trusted friend, someone who can review what you've done, if you've got a spouse that can double check, you know, even in the best of circumstances, and I'm not here, I'm not doing this to say, hey, you guys should hire Mark to do a review of your application. That's not the purpose of this. But because I get consult requests all the time from people who have done it and then had something fall apart, they did something wrong, well, it's too late then to seek a consult with me because there's nothing I can do. If, if We can sure put together another wonderful profile, but if the comprehensive ranking system score that you have, it it's never reaches the level that the rounds of invitations um, for which they extend invitations to apply, then there's nothing I could do. So one thing I love more than anything else, you guys, is to do those reviews. Those, for, for $2,500 Canadian, I go through everything for you. It's a complete review screen share just like this, where we share the screen, where I flip it around just like, just like I do in our videos. We look at everything together 
and we make 100% sure that nothing is missing. And so Sam, if you haven't yet submitted it, then I recommend you take a look and you, um, um, that you consider uh, booking um, a review for me and we can go through everything and make sure that it's 100% correct. All right, um, Priyanka says, US provides black and white PCC, is it fine? I'll answer that one right there, just for the simple reason that if the original police certificate is in black and white, then that's all you're gonna produce, right? It's just where it might be in color, and then you submit a black and white copy, that's where IRCC doesn't like it, okay? So, good, good question. And then I also wanna point out to Sam and everybody else, these videos are all sponsored by my Express Entry Complete Step-by-Step -step Guide to Doing It Yourself. And I've told you guys repeatedly, this guide goes through in painstaking detail. And because I've moved over to my new platform, I can't show you that there's 43 separate videos that break down the entire express entry process from beginning all the way to end. And I'm gonna do a little video and show people this. But this lifetime access, even for those of you who don't yet have an ITA and you're just waiting, you can subscribe now, get access to it, and then you can use it at any point or time in the future. And so when you click on purchase guide, the lifetime access, and I've, I've mentioned this a lot to you guys, if you type in EEDIY50 and apply it, it actually takes 50% off of the price, of the regular price. And this is lifetime access for $248.50 US, which is a, a fraction of what you'd pay some overseas agent or consultant who really doesn't know what they're doing you can educate yourself. You care more about your application than anyone else does. And um, that's one way. It's a way that I've, I've created um, uh, this, this guide. Like I said, it's got like 43, 44 individual videos. Is all designed to walk you step by step through the whole process. So I'd strongly encourage you considering it. And all you need to do is just type in CanadianImmigrationInstitute.com. It'll take you there. You go straight to the actual courses. And um, if I go back here... On the main page, you just go to individual guide, you click on that, and then it takes you right here where you click on learn more, and then you can find the guide. And there's a whole bunch of other information here. There's video testimonials from awesome people, and many of these have, have you've seen them in the videos, they've come, they've joined me as guests, and they purchased the guide in the early days, and they're permanent residents now. And so, all of this explains why I created it, and so, um, you know, because I've noticed lately that it seems like this, the video, uh, at least this guide is now hidden and people don't know where to find it. So that's where it is, guys. Okay. Great question, Sam. Thank you so much. All right. Um, okay. Let's see here. Muhammad says, why, why you didn't refund my course money? It automatically charged me for a second month without giving me notice. Please, sir, I need this amount. This is a great, great question, Mohammed. Thank you for posting this. So you've indicated that that you, it, and this is really important for me to address it because I want everybody to understand. When you purchase this, and when you go in and you purchase the guide, and you type in the information, so when you enter your email, you enter your credit card, and if you are selecting what, what Mohammed is talking about, actually I, I went to the wrong spot, what Muhammad is talking about, if you subscribe here to the monthly access right here, you'll see monthly auto renewal unless canceled. So Muhammad, you receive the benefit of it for, for, for one full month. And during that 30, during that time, you had a 30 day money back guarantee. And so when it carries over with this monthly auto renewal, I had many people, if, if I didn't do that, their subscription would cancel after the month and they would lose all the progress that they had that they'd made and I, did, I realized that early on when I set up this monthly access for $97 so the only way I could prevent that from happening was to make sure that it auto renewed and that's because of the platform that I'm on so that's what happened with you Muhammad and so how many people out there have subscribed for things all over the internet whether it's iTunes or not you've got 30 days and you've got that time period to cancel but Muhammad the last thing in the world I ever want is someone to feel like they were taken advantage of or they didn't know um, because that's not how I'm wired. So I'll go back, Muhammad, and I'll take a look and see what transpired um, because I never ever want anyone to feel like they were, they were somehow cheated. 
But I can tell you, Muhammad, for the $97 or whatever, and I guess you would have doubled that up and paid um, 200 a little bit shy of $200, the content of this whole guide is worth far more money than that. And I price this the way it is in order to make sure that people can afford it. It's not reflective of the value because I spent hundreds and hundreds of hours creating this. And this isn't just information that you get a step-by-step -step guide that people type out their explanation of how to do things. I actually go in and demonstrate every section of it. So Muhammad, your comment here is 100% something that I am concerned about. I will look at it and I will see. But understand, this is why I have this stated the way it is. And we will cross that bridge and we'll see what we can do to assist you, okay? So good question. I'm glad that you asked it. And anyone who comes in and tests it out and wants to see, this 30-day money-back guarantee is 100%, okay? And, well, whatever. You guys know how I, how I am. I don't need to convince anyone else. Okay, all right. So here's Elaine. Elaine says, um, Dear Mark, we haven't been in contact with you for a while now, but we have received some very exciting news. Oh, this is awesome. We finally, after a very long IRCC waiting period, eight months post AOR, we received our confirmation of permanent residence. We're absolutely ecstatic about the news, but we would like to take this opportunity to thank you for your ongoing support through your videos. I've personally watched all your videos since March 2018, and we firmly believe you helped us to preempt some pitfalls that could have caused issues. Thank you, Mark, you are awesome. That is so cool. I wanna show you guys here. I'm gonna go back to the YouTube channel and I'm, I wanna show you guys. Look, here's the videos, okay? So he says back to 2008, he's watched all the videos. So I am like scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. I don't even, so this is 10 months ago, 2008. March is like two years. So you can see how far back, guys. Like this is, that, that's, yeah, so this is probably, here's August, all the way back here to the very beginning. Really, that's when I started to do this, was, was right in May. I think that's when I did my first EE Live Q&A. So, Holy cow, that is a lot of videos, Elaine, that you've watched. Elaine Jean, <laughs> wow. <laughs> you guys are amazing. Okay, so here's the question, okay? Here's the question. So they've got a landing question that's stressing them out. They demonstrated proof of funds within three sections as follows. A was the fixed deposit investment account. Two was assets, property and cars. And three was liabilities, which were their asset backed loans. Well, I can tell you when it comes to assets, they don't mean anything to immigration. You can't show that you have a car or a home and value it at a certain amount and use that as proof of funds. It doesn't work. It has to be liquid funds. When you get into issues is with the fixed deposits, sometimes those funds are not necessarily available when you're ready to land. And so immigration can and sometimes does refuse applications when people are relying upon fixed deposits that are not liquid, they're not readily accessible. So the question that Alain Jean said is, the issue we have now is that we indicated to IRCC that everything will be liquidated upon immigration, but the various central bank tax procedures to release the funds for the investments and the property might exceed our, our January 9th, 2020 landing deadline. So would it be possible for us to sell our cars um, and use it for the proof of funds for landing purposes and also supply the immigration officer with documents that we applied for all the various procedures that are required by the relevant authorities? So in your situation, Alain Jean, I would definitely consider doing that. Now, many people will say, oh, Mark, that's crazy. You don't need to worry about that. But I'm telling you personally that it is 100%. You don't want to take any chances. What is the likelihood that a border officer is actually going to want to see your proof of funds? Maybe 5% or less. But what if that 5% is you? And what if an officer looks at it and he thinks, well, are those funds really available for your use? And you can't prove it? And it unravels your whole application. Because the law is one thing and people's experiences are completely another thing. And I, as a lawyer, do not deal in probabilities, which means, well, it's more likely than not an officer's not gonna ask the question. I don't deal with that. 
That's not how I operate. I deal in possibilities because I would never ever want to give you advice that you then relied on to your detriment. Okay, so I don't deal in probabilities. Uh, that's the world of consultants. All right, so when it comes to your situation here, I would, I would sell your cars, I would liquid the funds, I would have them in a bank account and then print off an updated bank statement. And that will be enough. Aside from your, um, your fixed deposit, um, you can have that kind of in the background, um, but at the end of the day, having that, those funds in, in the account will work, okay? But I would liquidate your vehicles, all right? Good question. Whew, that was a doozy. We're really, really cruising here. Okay, I'm going to ask two more. I'm going to go through two more of the questions that listeners sent in because I want to devote time to all of you faithful people who have stayed up to obscene hours of the morning in order to get your questions answered. But don't post them yet. Okay, uh, Stephanie says, um, Hi, Mark. Uh, CIC's admission target for this year is 81400 Okay, Anandit has spent a lot of time doing research that may or may not mean anything. Let's consider this. So the target this year was 81,400. Considering that last year's admission target was 74,900 and there were 89,000, so 74,900 issued. And, and so to get 74,900 was the admission target, they issued just under 90,000. So 19% difference here, Anandit says. And I do not waste time doing these calculations. So I'll leave that up to Anandit. He says they will now need to issue about 4,780 ITAs per draw, assuming that they continue their, their Wednesday bi-weekly pattern. Do you think this will happen? Is CIC deviating from its plan? What are your views on this? My friend, there are always ranges. Nothing is fixed. Nothing is locked in. They may have found last year that by issuing 89,800 ITAs that they actually ended up getting over 80,000 people that actually applied for permanent residence. That's possible. And so if that happened, then the reality is they're going to shift back and maybe they're not going to issue as many that extra 19% more ITAs because they feel that they no longer need to do that. People are understanding the rules. Fewer are getting rejected. Few are being withdrawn and that the more like the ITAs that they issue are converting to more or a greater percentage of EAPR uh, completions and finalization of permanent residence. So and indeed, I, I can't answer that. I don't know. Um, and in all honesty, except those people that are actually crunching those numbers and are tracking the data on a real time basis, um, they're the only ones. So I wish I could say that I know where you're getting at. I know you're hoping that they will expand it and maybe take 4,500, like you said here, or 4,007 in a draw, or 5,000 in a draw, such that the, the, the draw total, the round of invitation, um, the CRS drops down to a point where you're probably at and indeed. But that's not something that I can answer, but it's still a really good question. Okay, um, okay, Jazz, uh, Jazz Precor here says, Dear sir, I have a question. I and my spouse are living in Canada on open work permits. Great. I have CRS score of 473 without my spouse. Can I apply without my spouse? Whoa, man. Why did Stephanie lad let that one go through? Seriously. Okay. The reality is this question about spouses when you're in Canada, this is something that I cannot say one way or another what immigration is going to do. Um, I can tell you from a regulatory standpoint, there's no restrictions to someone listing their spouse as non-accompanying when they're actually in Canada. So to my knowledge, there is no internal policy directive at this stage. There is no regulatory or legal barrier to doing that such that um, it would be some kind of a misrepresentation or otherwise. There are so many situations where people uh, choose to do one thing or another. Someone may be on a work permit now, but they actually intend to go back home because they have an elderly family member that's not well. So the couple in Canada decides it doesn't make sense to add that spouse in if they're just going to go back home in a week or two weeks to care for that, that elderly uh, parent. And so in those circumstances, I could see absolutely nothing wrong with that family listing that, um, that spouse who's actually in Canada as non-accompanying within the express entry application. You know, and at the end of the day, um, 
because there hasn't been any directives to this stage, then if that's the circumstances for a client, I will proceed on that basis. If IRCC comes back and says, no, we are no longer accepting that, if your spouse is physically present in Canada, then it's physically impossible to list them as non-accompanying. If they come back with that, well, then us lawyers, we have two choices. We can then start advising our clients that way, um, or we can challenge the decision in federal court as to whether or not it is a reasonable interpretation of the legislation. But in your situation, um, Jaspreet, you can see that there are a lot of different factors that come into play, and you just need to make sure um, that you have a, a good rationale to support yourself um, and the reasoning for behind for, for doing that. All right. Okay. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to keep these other questions that are actually really good. I'm going to set those aside and I'm going to save those for next week. And um, those of you, as I scroll down here to the bottom, the last one that I have here is Ralph. So I'm going to start uh, right after Ralph's question. So even Ralph is going to have to repost. All right. So post your comments now, those of you who are faithfully watching live and uh, just by way of, of introduction to those who've jumped on a little bit later, understand that um, I have spent a lot of time trying to figure out, wow, look at these comments I'll post in. Let's see if I can get back to the right spot and hold it there. Wow, you guys have all been posting. You guys are all been holding off on me and you all clicked submit right at the same time. Okay, let's see here. Wow. Uh, let's see if I can find even where I left off. Oh, there it is. Okay. Okay, so Jay De Silva will be the first question that I answer. Okay. <laughs> so the reason that I do this, and some of you may wonder, why does Mark Holthy, Canadian immigration lawyer, ex-immigration officer, I worked on the border as, a, as an officer on the Canada-US border, and um, I worked uh, as a pro bono student to the hearings officers downtown Calgary who um, basically represent the minister in immigration appeals. I worked as a pro bono volunteer student with them while I was going through law school. And so that's what got me into immigration. That's how I fell in love with immigration. And then in that process or before actually working on the border, I had a career as a high school teacher. So I started, it wasn't really much of a career. I taught one year before I decided to go to law school. But that's, that's why I do this. I love teaching. That gives me my teaching fix. Um, I love immigration. You know, it's something that I know and understand because I worked on the border. And being a lawyer gives me an opportunity to, to do this, right? And so that's why I, I created the whole Canadian Immigration Institute. That's why I created my do-it-yourself guides. And remember, there's also the labor market impact assessment guide out there as well. If you have your employers who are wondering how to issue you a job offer, they can purchase that guide and get all the information they need to understand how to do it themselves. And once again, it's all designed to make life easier, more affordable for all of you guys. And when I started this, this whole world of social media, I started by blogging and I posted blogs and I knew that there were problems. I knew that there was changes coming to the permanent resident process that was going to severely impact many, especially Filipino workers that were working in Alberta at that time. And I knew that because of express entry, many of them would no longer be able to qualify. And so I started to write blogs to help them prepare so that they could find a way to transition from where they were to be able to still be eligible for express entry. Because I was doing consults. I was doing 10 a day, half hour consults with clients. And every time they'd come in, I'd say, well, there's nothing I can do to help you now. You should have come and saw me a year earlier. And so that's why I do this. I do this for two purposes. One, to teach to help to give back, to, to, to help people prevent themselves from being exploited or taken advantage of other, by, by other representatives that don't know what they're doing and are only looking to get their money, and even to prevent them from being, um, their lives being ruined because of helpful friends or helpful information on the internet. So as a Canadian immigration lawyer, this is so strange that lawyers would actually do this, that give away information for free. But my motivations are genuine. And so the second reason that I do it is because when you go online and you search for Immigration Lawyer Canada or even Immigration Representative, you get all kinds of slick websites and you don't even have a clue who's representing you, right? There might be one consultant that owns the whole thing or there might be one lawyer or whatever, but at the end of the day, you actually, in many cases, don't even know who's helping to prepare your application. 
And so how do you know who you can trust when everybody puts fancy YouTube videos that are pre-recorded, teaching people about all these aspects of express entry or immigration, when in reality, you don't even know if someone else wrote that script for them. And so I do this because you can't fake it. You cannot fake answering live questions in a Facebook Live video. And so I do it to, to build my platform, to build my credibility, to help people believe in me that if they do part with their hard-earned money, that they know what they're getting. I do it so that I can share this. You know, I can share about me that I'm a real human being. This was a couple weeks ago, my last ride of the summer up this trail up to Grizzly Lake. And this is what was waiting for me when I got up there, this awesome brook trout, which, you know, it was raining that day, but it was a wonderful experience. But I am, I'm a human being. I'm just like you guys. I'm not some stuffy lawyer. I grew up on a farm. We didn't have anything. And, you know, I was never this entitled person that just had everything handed to me. I had to work really hard for it. And fortunately, I'm in a country that allows people who, who have a good work ethic, that are prepared to make sacrifices, the opportunity to succeed in ways that doesn't exist in other countries. Now, there's no guarantee, even if you work hard, that you're going to be successful. But you have an opportunity here that doesn't exist in other countries. And that's what makes Canada so awesome. All right. Okay, there we go. Now let's jump to these questions. Okay, so Jay says, and I also want to qualify that if I don't get to your question, please, please understand that um, uh, that um, I will do my best, but it's not. I'm not going to be able to reach everyone. If you have a specific question, you can always book a paid consultation and we can go through that. All right, let's go here. All right, so uh, Jay says, Hi Mark, this question is regarding proof of funds. What exactly is meant by six months history? Is it the date six months prior to the date you lodge your APR application or six months prior to the date of your balance conf confirmation letter given by the bank? Well, ultimately, you, the, the date that you get your letter, um, Jay, is it's going to be six months back from that date. Because whatever day your, le your letter is signed, it, it has only one possibility, and that's going back six months. So it's not, you don't have to keep getting letters, new letters leading up to the submission of your EAPR just to make sure they're as fresh as possible and as close as possible. But I would never submit um, a, a proof of funds letter that was more than 30 days old. So that's kind of how I approach that. Okay, hope that helped. Actually, do you know what? Ugh, boy, guys, this is what I do. <sighs> okay, I can't help myself. Where is Jay asking this question? Where is it coming from? We're going to go back to the completeness check site. I'm going to type in proof uh, of funds. Oh, not proof. Proof of. There's funds. And this is what Jay's referring to. So you're going to get a letter from the institution. And then it says here, current balance as well as the average balance for the past six months. So ideally, Obviously, the letter is only going to be backwards six months. And so don't don't let your letter get more than 30 days old. Make sure it's within the past 30 days. So I would keep it fresh from the date that you submit your EAPR. Okay, good question. Okay, Avneet says, I've been uh, a track lead before and recently been promoted as associate consultant. I play a managerial role in an IT company. So please guide me. Can I go for a managerial knock with the same job title? Please help. Abneet, when it comes to determining whether or not you are meeting the minimum requirements for skilled work experience, let's see if I can find this here. Applications. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. We're going to go to the Federal Skilled Worker Program, the eligibility section, and then this is where it comes down to, okay? So when you're trying to claim your skilled work experience, this is what you're looking at, okay? You want to be able to show, and this language, and this I'll show you how this is different too, but you can see you must show that while working in your primary occupation, you performed the duty set out in the lead statement as well as all the essential duties. That is what you're focusing on. So whether or not you're considered to be a manager or not has nothing to do with title. It's all about the duties. So if 0231 is the one that you're looking at, and we go, and this applies to all of you out there. We go to the NOC, the National Occupational Classification System. We punch in 0213. And then for the purposes of AVNEET, Computer and Information Systems Managers, 
it all comes down to these duties. And if you look at the eligibility, it says all the essential duties and that you perform the duty set out in the lead statement. Okay, this actually, and, and it says here, all the essential duties and most of the main duties listed. Well, if we go back to the ministerial instructions, okay, and I don't want to complicate this, but I'll show you the difference in wording. So you can see here, as you go back to this, and let's see if we can actually find it. Um, bear with me here. We've got a lot. And it's foreign work experience that you guys are working through, okay? Let's see if it's here. I might actually have to go to the, okay. So, okay. So here it is. So you can see for foreign work experience, this is the actual law. So the law as it differs from how immigration interprets it, okay? So this is an important thing to understand. Sometimes they dumb things down for you guys, but it also has the, the, the potential of, of creating confusion. So you can see here, you must have performed the actions described in the lead statement. So if we go back to your search, the actions described in the lead statement are these ones. This is the lead statement and a substantial number of the main duties, including all of the essential duties set out in the national occupational classification. So you can see here, when we go to this position then, all of these right here, we want to show that, we, that you have performed a substantial number of these. And a rule of thumb is about 75%, but it could vary. It could be a little bit less than that, could be a little bit more, okay? So that's what you're focusing on, not title. All right, great question. Okay, let's jump to Abdullah. And he says, is it compulsory to mention previous year's work other than current job for the application of spouse work permit? Is it compulsory? Okay, so this is not an express entry question, Abdullah. Not an express entry question. <sighs> but you guys know how vulnerable I am. I can't help answering every question that's asked, whether it's express entry, whether it's work permits, whether it's spousal sponsorship, whether it's anything related to immigration, you know I can't help myself. Okay, let's take a look at your question again, Abdullah. Is it compulsory to mention previous year's work other than the current job for the application of spouse work permit? Well, if you're applying for your spouse's work permit, the most important thing is going forward. Are you working in a skilled occupation that is at least a knock B, A, or zero? Is your work permit, has it been issued for at least six months? And are you married? And it's that factor, not backwards looking how many years you've worked in the past, it's forward. Now that's a very simplistic way of looking at it, but as we, oh boy, I can't believe you guys, you, you just make me do this, don't you? So C42 is what we're looking for, IMP, IRCC. You guys eventually will figure out how to find this. This is the policy when it comes to work permits for Spouses of skilled workers. So we will scroll down here and you can see all of these different codes associated with the different kinds of work permits. And as a business immigration lawyer, which I very much am, I'm constantly advising clients on how to uh, big multinational companies on which of these work permits they can use or access without having to get a labor market impact assessment, which all of you guys need for the most part if you're outside of Canada to get points for job offers. But let's go down here. So we're scrolling through all of these until we get to the magical ones, right? We're just about there here. So these are public policy competitiveness codes. So you can see here, you can get an open work permit if you're a spouse of a skilled worker. So in this case, it's C42. And when we click on this one, wow, I can't believe I'm devoting this much time. I'm, I'm truly going to set up other live Q and A's to talk about other areas of immigration. But this here is explains very clearly what you need to do to prove it. So it's holding a work permit that's valid for a period of at least six months. Okay, that's really what it comes down to. So it doesn't talk about going backwards. All right, I'm going to copy this. I'm going to paste it into the comment section. And then I'm going to get back to answering express entry questions. And I'll also let you guys in on a little secret. Today's my birthday. So I have a little bit more flexibility because I told my staff I wasn't going to come into the office today. But in reality, I'm actually in the office. But I don't have as many consultations booked. Well, I have none today because I blocked it off. 
So I will spend just a little bit more of my birthday with you guys answering some questions to try to make sure as a nice bonus and thank you to you guys, um, especially those who purchase my Express Entry Complete Step-by-Step -step Guide, this is how I give back. So I'm going to take time and try to answer as many questions as possible. Okay, so don't feel like your question isn't going to get answered because I may just be able to get to it. Even though we're already at about an almost, we're, we just hit one hour. Okay, moving forward then. So there you go, Abdullah. Okay, uh, Raman Preet says, is it mandatory to inform CIC if I travel outside Canada after acknowledgement of receipt? I'm on a postgrad work permit, AOR September the 10th. Raman Preet, no, you can travel, it's fine. I do not worry about notifying them. Once you submit your EAPR, your application is locked in. So at that stage, I do not notify them about travel history. However, if I'm working for a company and it is a company where I indicate my work is ongoing or it's my current employer and I'm no longer working for them, then at that stage, I will notify them that that work history has come to an end. Why? Because for immigration purposes, they will treat it as if you're still working there. Um, also, if I moved to a different country or I relocate, then I'll update my address history. Okay, um, Jainish says, hello, I'm from India and my IELTS course is, okay, am I eligible for AP? Okay, so anything, Jainish, and anyone else who's asking specific questions, if you have questions about am I eligible for something, that's a question that relates specifically to you. And I would never, ever give that advice, that legal advice, in a live Q&A here because I would need to know so much more about you to make sure that the advice I'm giving you is based on the proper facts and a complete history. So Janish, you would need to book a, a consult. Stephanie, I know, has posted the link, but maybe I'll ask her to post it one more time uh, to our firm website. And for those of you who are wondering where Mark is directing you to, if you go to stringham.ca um, forward slash immigration, dash mark dash holthy it will take you here and this is where you can schedule a consultation and this is the best way to keep track of everything and make sure when you put your consult request in here that it says there's a section that says where did you hear about us well you heard about me essentially facebook canadian immigration institute right maybe you first found me in the facebook express entry law private facebook group so that's how you indicate and then that tells me that if people who are booking consults are coming from this social media avenue, then guess where I'm going to put my time? It's going to be here. Okay, so make sure you do that. All right. Okay, let's get down to some more questions. Okay, so uh, Anand says, um, in the Atlantic Immigration Pilot Program, okay, can big companies or banking sector provide job offers and not be used for AIPP? though they are not in designated employer list. Understand the Alberta, uh, the Atlantic Immigration Pilot Program, um, understand this list of designated employers. Anybody can become a designated employer if they meet the requirements. So the fact that they haven't yet um, doesn't mean that they can't in the future. So um, although that's not an express entry question, um, theoretically, as long as any company is new to the game and haven't yet set themselves up, um, they can still do that. Okay, um, okay, Ralph, your question, my friend, I really want to try and answer, but you guys need to focus these questions on express entry for today, okay? Okay, I'll answer yours, Ralph, and then I'm going to skip through the anyone else that is asking questions that are not express entry. And if there's enough people that have general immigration questions, then I will set up a different time right here, excuse me, on the Canadian Immigration Institute to answer general questions, okay? But for today, let's focus on express entry. Okay, Ralph says, if someone came as a visitor, is he able to book a job interview? Is it legal? Yeah, you, you totally, there's no issues with, with interviewing for jobs if you're here in Canada as a visitor. It's totally fine. Um, okay, all right, so let's skip through. Moisedin says, after submitting the express entry, while you're waiting, you get to know that spouse is expecting, spouse is pregnant. Do we have to update our express entry profile? If yes, how and where to update? Well, it all comes down to whether or not that child is going to be born before you get your, your passport request, you receive your confirmation of permanent residence and come and land in Canada. So if your baby is not yet born, there's nothing to notify IRCC about, okay? But if that child is born before you land, then you have to go through the whole process. And uh, Moisedin, I'd encourage you to book a consult with me and I can walk you through the whole process because 
it will add on at least another six months to your application if the child is born before you ultimately land in Canada. Because that child needs to have a birth certificate, a passport, photos, it has to have an immigration medical, and your information in your own application needs to be updated. And it affects your proof of funds too. Okay, um, you guys are multiple posting here. Okay, Gloria says, hi Mark, hope you're doing good. Gloria, I'm doing fantastic. Actually, do you know what? As a little fun thing, those of you who are watching and there's a good group of you, um, how old do you guys think I am? Because I've made a decision today that I'm no longer going to go by my real age. I'm going to pick a new age and that's what I'm going to go by. Because hey, you're only as old as you feel, right? So how old do you guys think I am? Just post in the comments. I'm curious to see what you guys think. Okay, so um, Gloria says, Hi Mark, hope you're doing good. Is aviation training done in Canada considered as a some level of education that we can use to claim points in EE? Gloria, that's a great question and um, I would need a whole lot more information in order to be able to answer that. We need to take a look at the school. We need to take a look at um, the actual program, um, the duration, all of those things. But that's a great question, one that it's impossible for me to answer here in our EE Live Q&A. So you just need to book a, a consultation and we can go through that. Okay, Mokaria says, hi Mark, you're doing a great job. Um, I have a question. Uh, do I need to show funds if I'm working as a full-time employee in Canada? If no, what should I explain? No, you do not. You don't. And let me show you, all right? Because that's what I do. I show. So if you go back, even for those of you who IRCC, CEC, um, uh, let's see here, proof of funds. Let's see if we can find the, the question right here. I think it is. Oh, look at that. They've changed it. Oh, no, maybe it's back here. Okay, okay, here we go, let's see. You can see right here at the bottom, you do not have to meet the funds requirement if you were invited to apply under the Canadian Experience class. So then you see here, the system currently asks all applicants to provide a proof of funds document. If you don't need to provide proof of funds, you must upload, here's the answer, upload a letter explaining either that you have been invited to apply or that you have a valid job offer. And those are the two factors. So I'm going to copy this right here. I'm going to post it into the comments section. If I can figure out where it is right there. And there's your link. Okay, good question, Mokoreya. All right, okay. Yuri says, hi Mark, I've received my GCMS notes. All seems to be nice and smooth. I'm 40 days away from COPR. It is shown in progress bar. However, in GCMS notes, there is no work experience confirmation or any progress. At what stage do IRCC confirm my work experience? If they still have not confirmed my experience, does it mean that there is an issue or something? Yuri, there's no, um, like right now, everybody's noticing that the processing times are climbing up above six months. It's just a reality. But every single person is different. There is no set timing on at what, you know, at what time period within that six months your work history is actually going to be reviewed. There just isn't. Um, if you get your GCMS notes and it says review required, then as was posted one of the earlier questions, then that means it's being triaged to another officer to dig into it and look into exactly um, whatever concern the first officer had with your work history. So when it comes to this, um, it's, it's all different for everyone. And I want to point out to everybody that your progress bar, that progress bar is completely, actually, I need to go full screen for this, okay? That progress bar in the express entry, your MyCIC portal is freaking useless. It serves absolutely no purpose other than to hopefully cause you guys to stop calling immigration um, as to the processing of your application. Why do I say that? It's because, take a look at the timing, look at when you filed your EAPR, and from that date, when you filed it, look to when it's estimated to be processed and do the math. The bar is set up six months and it advances chronologically through the days as time passes from the date that you submitted your EAPR. It is not individual or applicant specific. It's not customized for that. It is only a general bar that's tossed up that shows six months. So. <laughs> So if, you, if it shows that you have 40 days away from COPR, 
understand that just means you're 40 days to reaching six months processing. All right. In my meetings uh, with IRCC in our government meetings that I attended last spring, um, I had some discussions with uh, the head of Express Entry and it is something that they're working on. So to have individualized process bars. But at this stage, once you hit that six months, then it says, oh, your processing of your application is taking longer. And that's the extent of the customization. All right. Okay. Um, you guys who submit things multiple times. Crazy, crazy. Uh, okay, Parth says, um, okay, so Parth says, I have a total of 3.2 years of work experience. An initial two years were part-time where I accumulated 1,820 hours in part-time. And after that, I have full-time work experience. Now for eligibility, will I be eligible for express entry? Okay, that's another eligibility question. Uh, Parth, I need to actually go through everything in detail to see. Because understand, when it comes to express entry, all right, I'll shift back and I'll, I always want to give you guys something, even though I can't answer uh, specifically. When it comes to the eligibility assessment here for the Federal Skilled Worker Program, so I'll pull this up just a little bit more, you will see here that the requirements are such that you need to be able to show, just like you've indicated, one year continuous work, 1,560 hours, that's the main threshold, um, 30 hours per week. But if you scroll down here, you can see that they don't count any hours you work above 30 hours a week. So 30 hours is 1,560. So if you accumulate 1,560 hours in eight months versus 12 months, they're not gonna count any hours above the 30 hours per week, okay? So hopefully that answers that question. All right, next one. Um, try to skip through the duplications. Anna says, hi, I'm actually with a consultant right now for our MPNP application. He suggests that we apply for federal as well. Is it necessary? I feel like we're spending more than necessary there. Thank you. Anna, I can't answer the question. You've paid someone to give you advice. You're going to have to trust them or not trust them or fire them and hire me. It's as simple as that. I can't tell you or give you any explanation of the rationale. All I can say is that if you're submitting a Manitoba PNP and you are paying someone to help you do that, and that person's also telling you to submit a federal one, it tells me that there's no guarantee that you're gonna get that Manitoba PNP approved. Um, and if that's the case, then why are you paying them in the first place? And I'll just leave it at that. Once again, people looking to get money and don't even care about what your real interests are. Why would you pay someone? Why would you if there's no chance of getting approval? It's like all of you guys out there who are paying someone to submit your profile for you and your maximum CRS points are 430 or less or 440 or less, right? So there's, there's I shouldn't say that. You know, if, if I say 400 and maybe 400 and well, I can't even say points anymore. It all depends on the strategy, right? Why you're submitting it. But if you don't have a, a prayer of getting an ITA, Many agents will, will dupe you into paying them to submit a profile knowing you don't have a prayer. Okay. Okay. Um, Salman says, hey, Mark, I ordered GCMS notes uh, through GCMS Buddy. Oh, for goodness sakes. Oh. 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 <sighs> you don't need to do that. But anyways, I'm curious. How much does GCMS Buddy charge you guys to... to um, to, to submit it. Okay, he says it's crossed 40 days now. Uh, GCMS buddy has asked me if I want to file a complaint to Commissioner of Canada. What should I do? You're not going to file a complaint. What a freaking waste of money. Is, are, is GCMS buddy asking you for another feel, fee to file the complaint? Oh, Salmon, you've been watching my videos for how long? Why did you not just retain us to assist you? At the end of the day, it will be processed when they get around to processing it. You can file a complaint, but it doesn't mean anything. Sure, maybe they'll say, oh, we've got a higher workload. We're sorry about that. If you're paying GCMS Buddy to then file a complaint, don't waste your time. It's just taking longer to get them. All right, Umar says, hi, I've been watching your YouTube videos for months. You're doing great helping out people. You're very welcome, Umar. Okay, um, let's go down to... Okay, Mohammed Wasim, you need to book a paid consult if you want me to, to answer questions for you. Harry Shandigar, hello, Harry. Great to have you joining us. 
Um, Okay, so Rukshesh, same situation. You're going to need to book a consult if you want me to give you an assessment of your own specific situation. Um, I wouldn't be able to answer that here. Okay, all right. Um, and then we've got duplication. Okay, Moana says, I have, I have a problem with the police clearance for South Korea. My application was denied because of that. Any suggestions? Ah, oh, Moana, like the nature of your question, you need to book a consult there's no way that I can give you any direction or advice. I don't know why it was refused. Um, I don't know what the issue was. I don't know what the problem was. Um, your application was denied. Um, I need to look at everything. And the best way to do that is through a paid consultation. Then at that stage, we can assess whether or not you have a chance of fixing it. And these are the things that really, really, <coughs> just really, really hurt me because this could be your only chance at immigrating, but yet, so many people online says you don't need to hire anyone. Yeah, it's not anyone that you hire, but you do need to get help from someone who knows what they're doing. And if you take, if you if you choose to save money and do it yourself and rely on helpful information, <coughs> helpful information on the internet, and understand that I provide a lot of that information myself. But boy, like I'm a lawyer, and at the end of the day, the information that I'm giving you, it better be correct. Or the consequences for me, if you rely on it to your detriment, are massive. But when you guys file your, your information, like when you file your own applications, you're really taking it into your own hands. And often when people do it, get it returned, just like I talked about in the beginning, you may have passed up your opportunity to get another ITA. So Moana, um, I recommend that you book a, um, a consultation and have us look at it. Have me look at it and, and let me know um, and I can let you know if you have a chance. Okay. Um, okay, so Parth, same thing for you. Specific questions, we'll need to go through a consultation. Um, okay, Monica says, Hi, Mark. All my question went up. LOL. Anyway, is it okay to update express entry? Let's say job title, not code, and also proof of funds amount. More than requirements, knowing it has been done at the pre-ITA stage. Also, we don't need an, a letter leave for this, correct? Also, update reference letter. Duties are fine. Um, if you use one in PNP and later I just, okay. Yeah, so this one, Monica, you've got a lot of questions going on here. And all I can say is it depends. Can you change what you've put into your profile in when you're completing your EAPR? It depends entirely, Monica, on, on your situation, your circumstance. And so all of the questions that you've posted here, like do, do I withdraw, can I proceed forward, it all comes down to the A11.2 assessment. And so if you Google A11.2 EE, it will come up with this site and you will see that the determination really depends on whether or not um, when an officer reviews your ap application, um, they're looking to see and they say they can't issue a visa if you did not or does not meet the minimum entry criteria or the qualifications for which you had when you received your CRS score, so when your ITA was issued and when your EAPR was received by IRCC. So basically what that means is um, when you're trying to determine if a change in your application that you have to make, you have to determine whether it would have an impact on your eligibility for the Federal Skilled Worker Program, CEC, or Federal Skilled Trade Program, and if that change would result in your comprehensive ranking system score dropping below that round of that round of invitations in which you received your ITA. Okay, so same thing, Monica. I recommend you book a consult. Um, and the reality is, guys, all of these things that I'm sharing with you are all contained in my uh, in the course. Like they're all in here, and so. Um, I, I recommend, like for a fraction of what it would cost even to hire me, you're going to be able to get all of the information that I'm sharing here, all of the knowledge, these tips and, and, and all of the vast majority of questions that are being asked here are all contained within these many, many videos. And so um, I wish I could show you guys because I think people don't appreciate anymore how awesome this this course is now. And even because I moved it over to this new platform, it's like it's kind of people have not been able to find it. But I can, I can tell you, when you go and you click purchase, you, you purchase the guide, you can get, for those who are watching live right now, by typing in EEDIY50 and applying that code, 
you get lifetime access for $450 US and you can pay with your credit card or PayPal, it's easy. And all of this is in there. So um, I highly recommend that you, that you consider it. Okay, moving along. Okay, Jay's got one more question. Uh, actually, let's just see here. Um, okay, do I need to explain myself if I change the amount of money, which I said I have, um, on the expression of interest application to what I'm putting on my EAPR? So I'm assuming in your profile when you submitted it, as long as it's above the required threshold, please. No, you can, you can modify that. It's not the end of the world. You can do that. Okay. Um, okay. So Harmon, uh, Dollywall, you will also need to book a consult um, because at the end of the day, specific questions related to your unique circumstances <coughs> that don't benefit everyone, that has to go via a, uh, a consultation to make sure that I'm actually advising you properly. All right. Um, and I hope you guys understand why I can't answer those questions. Because if I make assumptions and then give you advice without the proper facts, then I'm, ne I'm negligent. And so questions about general information related to express entry, I can sometimes pull out of your question general information to benefit everyone else, but the specific stuff, you really have to book a paid consult. Okay, Avni, thanks. That was very helpful. You're very welcome. Okay, and I know there's a ton of other questions here. Uh -huh, Avni says, uh, happy birthday. <laughs> Jay says, happy birthday. Thanks, guys. Everybody's happy birthday me now. <laughs> All right. Okay, so let's see what we have here. Um, okay, uh, Mokaria says, um, happy birthday, Mark. Hi, Mark. You're doing a great job. I have a question. They, um, do I need to show funds if I'm working as a full-time employee? Okay, so I answered that one already. Okay, and then we're going through there. Harmon, Ralph. Okay, and those of you who are posting your questions like three or four or five times, please, please don't do that. Uh, Lawrence is happy birthday. Everybody's happy birthday in me. Um, okay, Ralph, you've posted it 500 times, my friend. Uh, let's see here if I can get down to the questions. Okay, Parth says, both my employers have residential address on the letterhead, but it differs from the one on the website. Can this be a problem for me? You'd need to explain it. So that's where a letter of explanation comes in saying why it's different. All right. Um, okay, M Munish says, hey Mark, can a girl non accompany her husband through express entry? Yes, they can. And that's a short answer. They, they can. You list them as non accompanying, but that spouse, and I'm assuming that's what you mean, um, or maybe is it a daughter? I can't tell. But either way, they can be listed as non accompanying. And, uh, but they'd still need to go through, if it's a spouse, police certificates and immigration medical. And if it's a dependent child, immigration medical. Okay, there Ralph says, thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Okay, zipping through here. Okay, Anand, okay, now we've got guest for age. Oh, I love this. This is so good. Okay, Anand says, oh, Anand is guessing all over the place. He says 36. Then he says 34. Uh, Nitika says, I want to book your consultation, but I'm not comfortable in giving my credit card details. What is the next best option to pay you? Uh, Nitika, the credit card is all through our secure portal. So it is not like an email address. It is secure. It, it is a secure portal. And so our, our credit card authorizations, we use a secure system so that your credit card information is 100% protected. And we're a law firm, right? So we can't mess with client information. So understand that what you complete is, is all in a secure environment. I would love to work with you. Okay, so we've got 36. <laughs> all right, and uh, wow, we've got a few, few people focusing on 34, 36, it looks like. Okay, um, trying to scroll through all of your duplication, you guys. Uh, Natika says, EE query, overlapping in work and education, is it allowed outside Canada? Yes, it is allowed outside Canada. It's just not allowed inside Canada. So if you're trying to claim work experience while you're studying on a study permit in Canada, it doesn't count. Okay, um, Moisedin says, thank you. Uh, Hina says, hello Mark, after transfer of inland spousal application to Etobicoke. Okay, this is a spousal, I'm gonna pass on that one. Um, and Parth, same thing for you. Anil says, happy birthday. Thank you, Anil. Uh, 
Um, Mosadine says, I'm already in Canada on work permit, so you still say that I don't have to update anywhere about spouse pregnancy. No, there's, there's no need to, to do that. Once the child is born, then you can do it. And I'll tell you why, because here's what happens, and I've already done this with my clients. They send a case-specific inquiry notifying IRCC that their spouse is pregnant. Then IRCC promptly sends all of the information to complete for that child after it's born and only gives 30 days to respond. And often this, the, the pregnancy is not, the child isn't gonna be born for four or five months. So understand that if you're in Canada, that child is gonna be born as a Canadian citizen. And, um, and uh, but in the circumstances of your express entry, it's only after that child is born that then you have an obligation to notify. Okay. Um, okay, now everybody's asking me to respond and answer the question three or four times. <laughs> okay, Anand says, any chance for a 450 in the near future? Oh, I wish I could answer that. Um, I think the likelihood is pretty low, given what we've seen and given the, the, the thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of international students who are now going through, I would think 450 probably is, is not high enough right now. But anything can happen. And remember, some provinces also extend notifications of interest, like, like um, Ontario, Alberta, other provinces. And so you may just very well, if your score is at 450, get one of those notifications of interest from one of the provinces. Um, Yash says, hi, can you please explain one year continuous work experience under one knock? I would be happy to do that, Yash. That's a question that I can, that I can answer. So if you go here and we look, we go right back to this page, okay, you can see that in order for you to meet the eligibility, and remember, this is only for the Federal Skilled Worker Program. So to, to meet the minimum requirements, you have to have worked in, in one <coughs> NOC, you can see here, that's zero A or B, okay? And then obviously you've had to have worked and performed a substantial number of the main duties. And then this is where you can see here, <clears throat> in the same type of job, which means the same knock, <laughs> all right, you have to have had at least within the last 10 years paid work that's at least one year of continuous or 1,560 hours, which is basically 30 hours per week. So what that means is you've worked for full time at least 30 hours a week for 12 months. But remember, right here, they don't count any hours above 30. So you can't work 1,560 hours and complete it in 10 months and count it. You can't. You have to work the full 12 months. That's the minimum threshold. So if you have met that, then you can count that eligibility, um, <clears throat> generally speaking, through the Federal Skilled Worker Program. But remember, there is a second part to this that many of you don't know about and it's under the selection factors. So just like CRS has a point calculation, so does the Federal Skilled Worker Program. And this is part of the eligibility to even get into the pool. You need to meet these requirements. And for if you're outside of Canada and it, you're not working in a, in a trade, it's the Federal Skilled Worker Program, so it's this. So you need to meet the 67 point threshold. And you do that by skilled work experience. You can see all of these things. But let's take a look at the selection factor itself, the grid. So it's based on language. So you can see 28 points for language. And it's based on education, 25 points for education, as well as work experience. So this is where some of you have to understand. This is where the continuous nature of the skilled work experience plays a role. You can only count points here in one knock, continuous. So if you want to claim six or more years to get 15 points to meet the 67 point threshold right here, to meet this, the 67 points, if you want to claim that for your work history, then what that means is, I went too far, it means that you have to have been continuously working in the same occupation in the same knock. But if you, some of you that, and really this is most of you, if you, only, if you have one year that you're claiming here in the same knock, and those nine points are enough together with all the other points that are being awarded 
to get you to that 67 points. So with only one year, for example, of skilled work experience, you have enough points to reach the 67 point pass mark right here. Then that's when it shifts then to the comprehensive ranking system. And then it's the comprehensive ranking system that allows you to claim work experience in other knocks as long as you continue to meet it's the fact that it's a skilled position paid continu continuous full time but understand the continuous nature only applies to meeting the initial threshold which like we've talked about and which we've looked at here which is um, the eligibility for the federal skilled worker program once you've met that eligibility um, with one knock then you can actually for the purposes of the comprehensive ranking system pull bits and pieces of work experience from other knocks as long as it's all skilled paid okay so hopefully that made sense <laughs> that was a good question though okay um, okay skimming through here okay Sanel says he's from Bosnia Herzegovina looking to move to Canada looking for options Sanel, book a consult and we can go through all of those. Um, let's see here. Okay, Ogun Kunkel says, Hi Mark, during my three years experience, there was a time my work was under renovation and we employees needed to work from home. Usually my major role involves design and can be done from home. During this period, I used the time to visit my folks abroad. Do I need to state it because it showed on my travel history? Okay, it all comes down to whether you're actually working that time. If you were not working during that period, 30 hours full time, then it would be a misrepresentation to say that. So if, however, you were, and you can show that you were continuing to work 30 hours minimum a week, then at that stage, um, your employer reference letter should really address that. And there should be some other proof or evidence to confirm that was the case. So that's really what it comes down to is trying to prove it. Okay, um, Janish says, my employer is registering, registered his business to his residential and handling the work through another office. Will it create any issues while submitting an experience letter? I need more information, Janish. I can't answer that one. Um, Uh, Gurjeet is also asking a question about PNPs, and I'm going to skip through those. Um, okay, Hugo says, I have submitted my online work visa. Okay, so that's work. So these questions need to be focused on express entry, but I promise I will do a general one. So those of you who have express entry questions, that's why this one is called an EE Live Q&A. But I can see now that lots of people are interested who have lots of different questions. So stay tuned, and I will try to do a regular um uh, Canadian immigration one okay um, uh, and then Yash um, your bold comments are actually annoying <laughs> I've answered your question about one year continuous but putting them in bold doesn't make it uh, more willing for me to answer it okay all right and some of you are duplicating them um, Ralph says sorry no problem Ralph that's fine uh, Anbu says, Mark, I'll be in Calgary next week. Can I schedule a, a personal consult with you? Um, Anbu, that's really cool. Reach out to Stephanie. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to be in Calgary next week. This week on Thursday, I actually travel to Quebec and the province of Quebec. And I'm going to be teaching the Quebec Immigration Lawyer Association um, how to use express entry for their clients that are living in Quebec and that are running out of options. But the following week, I have to check my schedule to see. I know I will be going up there, but um, Anbu, let me just, uh, I'll check with Stephanie, okay? Um, Sabi says, do you help with post-grad work permits? Yes, 100%. And I understand the complexity, the challenge with those things. There's been a lot of changes. There's still a lot of miscommunication. And we as a national, uh, the table officers on our national immigration section, it is an item that we have on our agenda to talk with the officers in December when we meet with them. And so, yes, I understand the challenges with post-grad. So Sabi, you bet, just book a consult. And really any of you who have questions about immigration, you're looking for guidance, help, you wanna hire a lawyer to represent you, or just hire me to review, 
I do everything. It's not just express injury. And if there's a particular aspect of immigration that is very, very focused, very niche, um, and it's not something I have a lot of experience doing, I will always have another lawyer that I can refer you to to help if I feel there's another lawyer who knows it better than I do. And that's how I operate. Okay. Um, Arthur says, hi from Edmonton. Hello. Yuki says, happy birthday. Adnan says, I will migrate alone. Then how much time will it take to bring the family in Canada? I uh, need to know the processing time. Well, if it's a spouse and dependent children, it, right now the processing times are about 12 months from the date you submit your application. Um, okay. Uh, okay, Yash says, all right, Yash. He says, I'm in Canada and I have four months of experience in one knock and eight months of knock in another knock. Mm -hmm. That's totally fine because you're applying under the Canadian experience class. Your Canadian work experience is treated differently than the federal skilled worker program and the foreign work experience. So you can use multiple lock knocks, different knocks for the purposes of your express entry. And Yash, you are really close to being able to meet the minimum threshold for the Canadian experience class. But if you want to book a consult, we can go through that and cover everything off and, and help you to prepare so that you're not burning up your postgrad work permit, uh, working in a position that doesn't qualify. Okay. All right. Because remember, it has to be skilled. It has to be skill level B, uh, A or zero. Okay. Anyone who's looking for a job, I don't help with that. Okay, and Monica, once again, you'll need to book a consult if you want me to go through your documents and check them out. You said you've got some issues here with um, it missing information. Um, uh, often re benefits, um, if you've forgotten to include them, they're not usually fatal in a reference letter. Um, and the bank letter, we're instructed to provide all bank accounts, all uh, debts, essentially. Um, if you haven't included it in it, 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 you know, it may not be an issue, but I don't deal in probabilities, right? I deal in possibilities. So it's possible that an officer could ask questions, but how are they going to know, right? It, it comes down to what evidence you've submitted. And um, obviously they can, they can ask for further information if they want to. And the last thing in the world you would want to, um, to see is an officer come back and ask for something that you should have included and then face possible misrep. But usually it's not a huge issue. Um, you've said, do we need to add credit card statements? I always add those. I include um, a copy of the last month's credit card statement because they ask for it. Um, okay, so Sumera is, it says they're here on an international work experience um, of one year. Is there any way to boost points? Um, language 100% is the is the the quickest way to increase your points is by rewriting the cell paper aisle, Sumera. So that's exactly what I would do. Um, Jay says that uh, that she's been lucky enough to get a job at the High Commission of Canada in their country. I'm starting this job after I submit my EAPR. Do I need to disclose this in additional information section? Until you're actually hired, until you're actually working, you don't need to disclose that. Okay, and there, Yash, I think I've answered more questions. Um, Sayada says, will the elections impact express entry procedure? Watch. <laughs> okay, Sayada, I encourage you to go back and go to my Canadian Immigration Institute right here. And you can find the episode that I did specifically addressing the question you've just asked me. And it's my favorite one. Is Express Entry doomed in 2020? This is where you go. And from here, I will share and I will uh, copy this and I'll put this right into the notes for you. So watch that one, okay? I think I got it in there. Maybe I didn't put it in. Let's try this again. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right, so, and of course I never shared my screen, so I will share my screen again. And so I'll go back and I put the link in there, but the, the one to watch is this one right here. That's called, Is Express Entry Doomed in 2020? 
and um, I put the link to it below here in your in, in the uh, comment section okay all right guys I think I'm just about at the stage where I'm gonna have to shut it down okay I think I've just about answered everybody's question that I could possibly answer um, okay okay uh, okay Monica in terms of your reference letter if you're changing things or modifying it from a PNP to when you're filing now that's something I would definitely uh, avoid um, I can't answer specifically because I don't know what the issues are but I never change anything I make sure things are 100% correct at the time in which I submit them um, yeah so Ahmed is asking can I use my work experience for express entry that occurred before completing my master's degree I'm claiming full points with the master's degree yeah remember it has nothing to do with your education it's whether or not you performed a substantial number of the main duties and all of the activities in the lead statement of the NOC. That's what's the factor, not whether you meet the education or employment requirements that are set out in the bottom section. Um, that's for foreign work experience. Uh, Nutika says, I left my job and rejoined after two months. Should I make two reference letters according to dates or take one letter with duration? Make sure your, your time is specifically carved out, that they don't just say it was you were all working for the same company when you weren't um, but at the end of the day they can just put it into two different blocks and set it out in the same letter you don't need two letters and then when it comes time to uploading into your document checklist um, yeah there might be two sections but I actually break it down so that there's no confusion and I create separate entries for it all right Sayeda says thanks so much Monica thanks and I will end with Roshi and Roshi's question here is, can I use um, fixed deposit to show proof of funds as long as it's above the threshold value? Fixed deposits don't have monthly statements like bank accounts, so if some fixed deposits are less than six months, what can I do? So Roshi, the reality is with those fixed deposits is a statement is usually sufficient, but you need to confirm that those funds are liquid, that you can pull them out, and that there is going to be sufficient funds readily available to land when you actually immigrate to Canada. All right, guys, thanks so much. That was a super long one. Um, and I wanna uh, express appreciation to everybody that's watched and that has rode this out the whole time. Wow, I've spent an hour and 41 minutes. Whew, that's a lot of time. <laughs> so those of you who are watching this as a video, all you need to do is send an email to stephanie at stringham.ca and put EE Live Q&A in the subject line. And then she will determine if your question gets answered like these fine folks here today. Um, those of you who have the courage to come on live and to tune in live and the patience, well, those, everybody that tuned in today was rewarded. So I want to express appreciation to all of you for tuning in. Make sure you share this, let other people know, make sure that you, um, that you like the page and uh, that will assist in you getting notifications and turn your notifications on so that when I go live you know it because I may very well start to do more impromptu ones just when I have a moment jump on answer some questions and if you don't want to miss those opportunities make sure that when you go to the page that you subscribe um, for the YouTube channel and that you also um, go to our page and I guess it's you know sign up or, or you like it whatever it is I'm not sure how it works. I guess follow maybe. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how this works. Maybe some of you guys know better than me, but there's a bunch of buttons up there. So like it, follow it, share it. There's even a sign up button. I don't know how that, I don't know where that one goes, but do it all and maybe you'll get notified so that you won't miss the next one. But every Tuesday at noon, Mountain Standard Time, I try to do this EE Live Q&A, even on my birthday. And it's my opportunity to give back to all of you amazing people that have um, had faith and confidence and trust in me and uh, um, just make this community what it is. All right, this is Mark Holthy, Canadian immigration lawyer, ex-immigration officer, and former high school teacher wishing you guys all the best this lovely Tuesday as uh, you navigate this crazy world we all call Express Entry. Take care.